next 20 years, next, before 2050. Science and technology. From the population increase, urbanization, industrialization, digitalization, and the globalization. I know a lot of people don't agree with me. They said no, but actually during past five years or 10 years, much, much quicker than ever before, globalization. Globalization is not only controlled by the traders, or by the uh, politician. No, it's controlled, it's driven by the fundamental science force. It's a real fundamental driving force from science and technology. Look, tech, but IT and the BT, and also all the transport uh, disease control. That's why they, I encourage all the chief economists to look at the beyond also the jump out of their box. I know a lot of people say, oh, the globalization slow down. No, it's a speed up. Because based on your traditional part being of the social science, based on our trade volume still increased much during the past five years. And how much connected by the digital technology? It's much, much closer. And the FO, yeah? If we organize so many 200 events like this, four days or five days, how much it cost before? And now we only cost about 10% of them before. Have you asked me? Because science and technology advancement and application in here. So I just take this to let you know and what is the real demand for that big picture. And then come to the rural development, and then come to the agri-food system transformation, and then come to the, our, your own field, agriculture, science, and technology development, uh, R&D, yeah? So I stop here. Now I'm going to read the uh, official statement. <laughs> Uh, uh, that's my real, uh, uh, you know, thought as a, as a former chief scientist. You, you ask uh, two questions to uh, one president of a university. We were friends, Professor Sen, we were friends for more than 30 years. He from the poorest province in China, Gansu province. When he was a kid, he, he always uh, uh, with his mommy to took the two bags of the potato come to the neighbor province to trade with the little rice and wheat. So that's uh, the uh, uh, chief science now in, uh, in, for agriculture in China. And also the, yesterday, another my former colleagues, he is a real chief science on the uh, airspace breeding program 25 years ago. You didn't know, we launched a special satellite, cost about 200 million yen that time. 2003, I was a, a, a responsible person to launch. But you see now the IAEA, they got the uh, first there, uh, also put the seeds. But we specially designed one satellite, put all the seeds, including microtube of potato, to the space 25 years ago. We didn't say too much because we do. Yeah, we don't know how to exaggerate to say something. And then you suddenly find, oh, you have so many new varieties from the uh, space breeding program. But he was chief science on that. So I just mentioned that to you. So the, I always say the walk the talk and not talk too much. Yeah, my friends from Africa, from uh, Latin America, you can't change your agriculture system by talking. You had to work in the field to have the farmers with the new varieties, no matter gene editing, no matter conventional breeding, no matter the improvement of gene plasma or biodiversity use for, for the food. So that's a real experience I want to share with you. you. Uh, science and innovation. Also, you have to, you have to work with others, not only strategy on the climate change, other strategies. Because based on my first day, my personal comments, yeah, I encourage both of you start the FO headquarters and the leading the new business model, how to build a synergy at the regional level, at the country level. First, start with FO office and the networks. And then the members, you can bring the relevant ministries, not only Ministry of Agriculture and Food and 
rural areas, and the Minister of Education, Science, Minister of Investment, Economy, you name it, yeah, or Environment. And then they work together because I know I was a vice minister of agriculture of China. We need the also synergy at the country level. Of course, they, they, are, they have their own system uh, arrangement, but if you at least play the facilitated role to make these two strategies land on the members with relevant partners together. That's, and of course, the others we will of the necessary tools and the platform like this one to the members. If we need, we can start the different relevant members in the different regions first. And they, like Ambaraba from Latin America or others from Africa, I got to know there is a very good professor in Ghana. Yeah? And so, He's out of our, our scoop. He's uh, very good. I should say we should support him yeah, to make also Africa, not only uh, you know some people, eh? <laughs> we should open to get all the inclusive people to support us. Mission in Africa, Kenya or Ethiopia or others, or South Africa, or because you are going to uh, CJR CEO after this conference. So <laughs> I really encourage you to take the leading role and how to build a synergy with the FAO, with the relevant members and also FAO office in the country and the region. And last but not least, climate change strategy covered so many areas, but at least FAO, we should take our own part to work with the relevant organizations, build a synergy. Because FAO, you are DDG on behalf of FAO. We should work with the UNFCC or whatever, UNCCD, and at the UN level, build the synergy. That's why I encourage you last time and the COP27, now it's coming COP28. We should work with the relevant uh, UN agencies and, and uh, uh, programs and the funds, whatever. And of course, beyond that, through hand in hand partners, uh, international organizations, private sectors, and, and also NGOs and the build the uh, uh, climate change strategy also more relevant to the members, to the ground, to the people, especially farmers and consumers. Uh, thank you, I stop off here. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, DG, for your opening remark and thank you for giving us a piece of your mind as well, sharing with us your experience and um, maybe it's, it's very important, DG, to stress that this both action plans were really discussed and they were developed at the country level, at the regional level. So I always tell people we have the global action plan, but there is so much detail behind that is within, done at the country level and the regional level. So for donors, if you are looking for new projects, come and look at those action plans, both on climate change and science and innovation strategy because you will find lots of new ideas that we can carry forward. So as I said earlier, we have a panel of six people are going to be moderating the first session and then DDG Maria Elena Semedo will moderate the second one. Our speakers come from different regions, different sectors, going to present different cases from the implementation of both strategies. So let me introduce the first panel. We have with us Dr. Silvia Masruha, the president of Imbrapa from Brazil, and she is the first woman president of Imbrapa. Thank you very much. Please help me to introduce Silvia. We have with us Mohamed Bashri, the director of strategy and partnership, natural agency for the development of Waze Zone of, and the Argan Tree in Morocco. Welcome, Dr. Mohamed Bashri. Yeah, you can. And then we have with us as well, Dr. Sorlati Senshu, geospatial land planning expert, coming the whole way from Democratic Republic of Laos. She comes from the Department of Agriculture Land Management at the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry in the Popular Democratic Republic of Laos. Most welcome, Sorlati. So let us kick start this panel and I will start with Dr. Silvia Masruha. 
Sylvia, we know that Imbrapa has a successful case of transfer of technology for climate action at regional level, which use several types of innovations such as technological, social, institutional, financial, and others. Would you like to briefly describe this project in about eight minutes mm. <laughs> and tell us what were the success factors and challenges and the importance of partnership, including South-South Triangular Cooperation? Over to you, Sylvia. Thank you, Shimano. Thank you very much. Uh, first, uh, I'd like to thank you for, for inviting Brapa to share this positive experience here. Uh, my greetings is to do Dr. Chu uh, Dong Yu, uh, the Director General of uh, FEO, uh, Dr. Ismahani Eloafi, Dr. Maria Elena Semedo, thank you very much. Uh, the Cotton Project, the Cotton Plus Project, Mais Agudão in Portuguese, <laughs> is a, a project of the Brazilian Cooperation Agency uh, and the FAO. FAO uh, with Embrapa. Embrapa is Brazilian Agricultural Research Corporation. This project uh, completes 10 years in this year. Uh, this project involves 80 countries, Argentina, Ecuador, Bolivia, Brazil, Colombia, Haiti, Paraguay, and Peru. The, the resource for development this project came from the uh, Brazilian Cot Institute, IBA, is a trilateral South-South cooperation project. During this period, several missions to the different countries that the part of the project, the cotton, to improve the cotton sector in Latin America were realized. The main technical cooperation and the technology transfer actions were made to improve the seed produ production sector, sector, pest management, cultural practice, and use the more productive, productive cultivars with better fiber quality for small producers and indigenous peoples. In addition, the inter, the inter institutional relationship of the organization of the production chain has been decided for the good results of, of the project. As at the same time, Embrapa has been uh, developing uh, equipments for use by small producers, aiming to reduce human effort in the operations involved the entire crop cycle. This is how como the one how harvester was created, e equipment that used the same harvesting technology used on large properties, but which can be pulled by a tractor and is affordable for small producers uh, cooperatives. In addition to the harvest, other equipment such as planter, fertilizer, sprayer, plow, and the trailer were, were developed and there is also in validation phase two. This equipment is adapted for traction with motorcycles. Likewise, this equipment can be manufactured by hand in metal works in any, any country, falling in the original design. Over these 10 years, several technical demonstration units were implemented in different counters to play the role of, of field schools, where all training aimed to manage cot cultivation for plant to harvesting was carried out. More than 10,000 farmers were trained. 128 demo plots. 155 field days, more than 2,400 to, to local technicals and the professionals were trained. The results were reflected and the greater organizational capacity of small producers improved the crop and the pest management practice and decreased crop productive levels. We can summarize the main advantages achieved in, the, in this project. Greater interinstitutional interaction, improvement in cultural practice and pastoral control, greater organization of the seed sector and using more productive varieties, 
understand the importance of verticalization of the culture through the process of seed cutting in mini mills for communalization of the lint. Better understanding of the governance of the production organization and the management of the cotton business on small properties. To finish, I want to highlight the main challenges, uh, such as uh, two challenges. Uh, the first, consolidation of advances already achieved through public policies aimed at small producers, mechanization of farming to reduce the human force used in its management, as well as achieving greater cotton productive and greater work efficiency. It's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Silvia. Uh, thank you very much for sharing with us this great example, and you have already very strong monitoring you shared with us the number of people trained the number of practices that used the interaction between institutions so prepare your questions we're going to go through the three speakers and then we're going to come for a q and a so keep your question for dr sylvia till we go through the next two presentations je vais bouger à monsieur mohamed bashri monsieur bashri dans la mise en œuvre du projet au asile Comment l'innovation a-t-elle été utilisée pour revitaliser les agro-systèmes oisiens, notamment en matière hydrique, dans la région du Dar Atafilelt, devenant ainsi un projet d'action climatique important Peut-être juste pour, pour rappeler à tout le monde, cette nouvelle institution à faire attention aux oasis au Maroc a été lancée en fait en 2017 durant la COP 20. 22, durant la COP 22. Alors c'est nouveau et c'était fait justement comme une action pour aider à protéger les oasis au Maroc et aussi les Argan Tree. À vous, Monsieur Mohamed. Merci beaucoup, Madame. Et à travers vous, je voudrais également remercier la FAO de nous avoir conviés à, cette, à ce forum. Je suis ici pour vous parler un peu du projet et les innovations scientifiques et techniques qui ont été mises en place dans le cadre de ce projet. Alors le projet OASIL a été préparé pour qu'il soit présenté à la conférence des parties, la COP22, qui a été organisée au Maroc en 2016. C'était la COP de l'action après la COP 2015, qui était la COP de la Convention. C'est un projet qui prend en considération l'impact des changements climatiques si les oasis, et le choix, le choix des oasis n'est pas inodin. Je vais y revenir par la suite. Donc, les diagnostics effectués ont bien montré que dans ces zones-là, il y a une forte dégradation des ressources naturelles. Bon, il y a quelques slides ici. Bon, ce n'est pas un PowerPoint. C'est juste pour rappeler un petit peu les composantes du projet avec l'étendue de ce projet. Je vais essayer de présenter les deux aspects relatifs à l'innovation en matière de caractère à caractère scientifique et technique, et puis aussi l'approche qui a été innovante en matière de planification et de gouvernance prodiguée dans le cadre de ce projet. Concernant les aspects innovants à caractère scientifique et technique, je vais citer quelques exemples. Tout d'abord, les oasis dans la région de, de, de Ratafilelt ne présentent pas les mêmes caractères et caractéristiques. Donc, au début, nous avons commencé par une typologie des oasis qui a été faite et qui a été basée sur un, une analyse multifactorielle, différents critères topographiques, hydriques, socio-économiques, et ainsi de suite. Donc, sur la base de cette analyse, on a trouvé euh, 19 types de oasis ont été identifiés dans la région en question et la question de l'eau se présente différemment si on est dans les oasis de montagne ou dans les oasis de plaine. Cette typologie spatiale constitue une base, a constitué une base d'orientation des interventions par la suite. Deuxièmement, l'amélioration des connaissances et les oasis, notamment les ressources naturelles et autres volets auxquels le projet a accordé une une importance fondamentale. Il a ainsi mené des études sur la biodiversité, l'eau, le sol, ainsi que les facteurs de dégradation et les approches et les moyens 
pour les préserver et les gérer durablement. L'impact des changements climatiques a été euh, pris en considération. Le troisième exemple, la question de l'eau, constitue une demande euh, pressante, aussi bien par les partenaires du projet que par les bénéficiaires. Ainsi, une importance particulière lui a été accordée et a été traité en priorité selon deux axes. Un axe sur l'amélioration des connaissances et un axe sur la mobilisation de, et la préservation de la ressource elle-même. Quatrièmement, en termes d'amélioration des connaissances sur les ressources hydriques, le projet a réalisé une étude sur la comptabilité et l'audit de l'eau. C'est un nouveau concept développé par l'AFAO qui cherche à préciser toute la terminologie autour de l'eau. Les ressources hydriques ainsi que les utilisations sont actuellement bien connues dans cette zone. Cinquièmement, en termes de mobilisation de préservation des de ressources hydriques, le projet a contribué à la mise en place d'un réseau de piézomètres pour le suivi des nappes. C'est très important, le renforcement d'un maillage de reconnaissance pour permettre de modéliser la nappe. Installer des stations de mesure de cours d'eau, c'est aussi des éléments très importants pour comprendre, pour maîtriser un petit peu toute, euh, toute l'offre de l'eau dans la zone. Il a conduit des études de faisabilité de projets de, reja, de recharge de la nappe. Ce sont des choses aussi nouvelles pour utiliser surtout les eaux non conventionnelles dans ces zones-là. Il, euh, il, il a fait des études de réhabilitation des Khtara. J'utilise le mot Khtara parce que c'est euh, une pratique ancestrale de mobilisation des eaux souterraines. Et donc le projet a contribué à renforcer l'efficience de ces ouvrages traditionnels. Il a créé des points d'eau dans les parcours et transhumants, vu le changement climatique, ces zones-là, qui, euh, qui constituaient des passages des transhumants, a connu un tarissement des ressources et donc il a euh, répondu aux urgences de, sur le, teneur, le terrain. Il a mené aussi des études d'assainissement et liquide dans, les, dans la zone, cette zone aussi, avec la rareté de l'eau, il connaît des, euh, des, con, de, des conditions de pollution de ces eaux. Alors, je reviens au deuxième point concernant l'amélioration de la planification et de la gouvernance. Le projet a adopté une approche participative à tous les niveaux avec les acteurs de gestion des agroécosystèmes moisiens. Donc, en plus de ces relations entretenues avec l'administration la, la, centrale, le projet a mis en place des canaux de communication, de concertation avec les, les, les acteurs au niveau de la région, des provinces et des communes. Donc, le comité de pilotage qui est présidé par le département de développement durable au niveau du Maroc, il est le département qui, je dirais, pilote toutes les activités du projet. Il y a un deuxième niveau au niveau régional, il y a une unité de projet qui est présidée par l'agence, l'agence de développement des zones et de l'Arganier. Et au niveau local, il y a des comités de concertation et d'orientation qui ont été instaurés avec des groupes englobants, en plus de, des représentants d'administration, les élus et les représentants de la société civile. De même, le projet a également œuvré pour intégrer la gestion durable des ressources naturelles à différents niveaux de la planification de développement. Donc, il y a différents outils de développement qui sont élaborés et le projet a intégré ces outils de développement, à savoir le, développement, le plan de développement régional, le plan de développement provinciaux et les plans d'action commune. En conclusion, je peux dire que le projet OASIL a considérablement euh, a pris en considérant les efforts des changements climatiques sur les agroécosystèmes moisiens, a pu intégrer la gestion durable des ressources naturelles, notamment hydriques, dans la planification de développement de la région. C'est une approche innovante dans la mesure qu'il a déclenché un dialogue politique appuyé par des arguments scientifiques pour une, une revitalisation des, des agroécosystèmes dans cette région. C'est par les moyens scientifiques et techniques rationnels que le projet a bien voulu aborder la mitigation des effets changement climatique. Ceci en travaillant à différentes échelles, locales avec les communes rurales, avec la mise en place des outils de gestion durable euh, prodigués, régional et provincial comptabilité de l'eau par bassin versant et national pour faire face à la rarification des ressources naturelles, la diversification des activités en se basant sur les richesses patrimoniales des sites à travers les CIPAM. 
et à l'échelle internationale, le projet a appuyé l'initiative Voisis Durable pour hisser la problématique, euh, la problématique des, 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 changements, des effets des, des changements climatiques au niveau des oasis à l'échelle internationale et créer une instance internationale pour la reconnaissance des oasis comme espace vulnérable devant les changements climatiques. Deuxièmement, la préservation de ces espaces en mettant en place les mécanismes appropriés pour la sauvegarde des richesses dont recèlent ces espaces. Et en dernier lieu, le développement durable en assurant avec, les, en assurant avec la population qui vivent dans ces espaces les moyens appropriés pour mener une vie décente dans ces zones. Donc je peux dire que le projet est un exemple d'une approche holistique pour faire face au changement climatique, moyennant des solutions scientifiques technique rationnelle. Merci beaucoup de votre attention. Merci Mohamed pour, euh, pour partager avec nous cet exemple vraiment qui montre comment on peut travailler au niveau d'un agro-écosystème et avoir vraiment pas seulement une innovation institutionnelle, mais aussi un, une innovation dans la gouvernance, une, une innovation dans la science, policy interface, et j'en suis sûre qu'on aura des questions. Les oasis, pour ceux qui ne connaissent pas les oasis, c'est vraiment des systèmes très intéressants, très ancestrales, mais aussi qui sont très fragiles envers le changement climatique. Maintenant, on va... Uh, we're going to move to Mrs. Senshu. So, Sorlati, please, if you can come here. Sorlati, I would like to refer to a very successful project in Lao D. PDR between FAO two ministries, both climate change and environment, environment ministry and agricultural ministry. And the question is, agriculture and fisheries ministries and environment and natural resource ministry. Why is this FAO project called strengthening agroclimatic monitoring and information system considered an innovative project and how did it contribute to climate action in your country? Over to you, Solati. Thank you very much for your question. First of all, I would like to say thank you to FAO and Sami's project and also my government that gave me a chance for a speak today. So, uh, is this okay? Can you come closer? Okay. So for the questions, why Sami's is considered as an innovative project because SAMIS has developed multi-ministry database is a database that managed by district office, which used for two different applications. One is agrometeorology, which called LAXA, and we, which uh, includes uh, meteor office, agri agriculture and management, soil research center, and plant protection office which is necessary for uh, farmers and laksa also produce a crop recommendation every week and every month by uh, soy and water and crop uh, modeling and also every week we produce 144 weekly bulletins and 18 uh, monthly bulletin every month and another app is called Elrims and Land Resource Information System. It's an online and free uh, can access and download all the data that we produce. Uh, and it is necessary for a policy maker. And this app, we use machine learning application for uh, geospatial purpose, yeah. Uh, such as we use it on creating cropland cover map and we also uh, performance climate task scaling <laughs> oh, sorry <laughs> performance climate task scaling using uh, Kobo circulation models and uh, national data and we also scenarios uh, future climate and crop productivity that uh, and also develops uh, 
software called PYZ because of the needs of our governments. And for develop, uh, for management board to application, we also uh, establish the collaboration between two ministries for management, DSAP, and also policy for manage real time F and F management, and also the data collection and data sharing agreements between ministry. SAMIS contribute to climate action because it is a great success for uh, climate action to farmers. Every RF application apply online for more than five years and now it's still continuously and maintained by governments. Uh, and we cover more than 110,000 farmers in whole country uh, with agro meteorology advisories. We distribute all the data that we have to farmer via farmer field school, uh, so no more farmer group, loudspeaker, and school poster. And also every Monday evening, it's a show on TV shows and uh, national radios. We also develop a system for distribute the data through the public announcements that other or donor can use it when even they don't have a plan, like a ADB, a CARE, ESNV, and other can use it in the school. And we have, have a study and found out that more than 80% of farmers who listen to loudspeaker change their crop behavior. Yeah, but uh, for the policy maker, we not only produce the map, we also can access the historical and future agriculture productivity scenario by using a method called foresight analysis, which allow us to study future of agriculture and lead us to produce a policy recommendation and a story map. And there are two levels of impact for policy maker. The first one is a national level. National level, it's, uh, it's a great, that uh, governments of Chambasak province is one province in Laos that uh, use uh, our story map to decide to stop cult cultivate uh, cassava production and yeah, still you cultivate uh, coffee. And for the local level, we insert a system called future informed plannings mm -hmm. in a village level and allow farmers to take decision that uh, they can participate on how to uh, do their land use planning in the future. And we plan to use it in uh, 800 winlets during a summit so that is uh, being prepared now. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Orlati. Thank you very much, Sorlati, for sharing with us your example and also showcasing that not, on, not only you shared information with the farmers, but also give them a chance to use the model for the future. So you have already the next steps clear for you. Now we have about eight minutes for a Q&A for the three case studies. So what I would like is, uh, I see Joachim hand up. Joachim, I'll give you the floor. Thank you. My question is uh, to President Silvia Masrua. <clears throat> Agriculture has a problem under climate change to adapt to changing situations. 
but there may also be opportunities for agriculture to help mitigate. What is Brazilian science and proper science saying about carbon farming, agronomic practices to bring more carbon back into soils? Is that an opportunity? What does the science say about carbon farming? Yes. Uh, you have a, uh, do we have a hand mic? Yeah. Maybe easier, Sylvia, if you use this one. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, Embrapa has several projects in climate change. Embrapa has um, uh, a portfolio, uh, um, uh, set of projects in climate change to discuss uh, uh, carbon, uh, the mitigate of uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, in soil. Uh, we, uh, I have to uh, incentive to, to use some technologies, for example, no-till no planting, uh, integrated systems production, for example, uh, integrated crop, livestock, uh, forest uh, system, uh, and the, uh, by, uh, the use of by-input products, and the others uh, to uh, and I, I have to analyze how uh, uh, by, um, how this technology can uh, mitigate the carbon in uh, in soil. In soil. Uh, but I have several projects so we can uh, discuss more about this project if you if necessary. Thank you. Very much. Thank you very much, Sylvia. Do we have another question in the room? Otherwise, also we have questions from the internet, from uh, the people connect, connected remotely. Any question from the floor? I think you need to raise your hands with all so much light. No question? Am I missing something? No? Okay. So I do have uh, a question from the people connected online. So for Oazil, euh, Mohamed, la, la question euh, en français, c'est ou en anglais, ce que vous voulez. C'est quoi le rôle de FAO dans Oisil Qu'est-ce qu'on qu qu a pu faire pour vous Comment on vous a supporté Et c'est quoi le, le, les prochaines étapes qu'on peut vous aider plus avec Oui, uh, the mic. Uh, il est avec Sylvia. Sylvia, the mic, please, for Mohamed. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Merci beaucoup. C'est une pertinente question. L'EFAO nous a aidé pour le côté scientifique et technique. Son rôle était toujours l'appui technique et scientifique dans la plupart des projets et particulièrement dans le cadre de, de, de ce projet au asile. Donc, je dirais la problématique et le diagnostic, il était déjà là parce que les oasis se trouver au front des changements climatiques. C'est là où on trouve un peu l'expression de vraiment flagrante de changements climatiques. Il y a les extrêmes d'eau, de, enfin les extrêmes de sécheresse et d'arrivée de, d'eau. Donc le choix n'était pas anodin. Donc c'est un lieu où on peut voir et on peut palper avec, je dirais, concrètement les effets des changements climatiques. Et dans ce sens, le, les FAO, il est venu avec des solutions pour euh, permettre euh, à la population de s'adapter à ce changement, je dirais, brutal. C'est ça ce qui est difficile pour la population locale. La brutalité du changement fait que euh, la population n'arrive pas à supporter euh, ce changement. Les solutions sont très simples. C'est d'apporter tout d'abord un, un, un appui local, c'est-à-dire venir à l'aide de la population. Ce sont des actions, je dirais, très ponctuelles, donc des actions locales. Et puis, juste après, pour permettre la durabilité des solutions, il faut les mettre dans les, les, les outils de gouvernance locale, provinciale et régionale. 
Et c'est là aussi que, euh, vu la pertinence et l'importance des choix qui ont été euh, faits, ils étaient, ils étaient pris en considération dans ces outils de management local. C'est-à-dire, il y a déjà des outils management local, provincial, régional, qui ont pris en considération les, euh, les solutions qui ont été développées avec le projet OASIL, avec la FAO, qui ont été développées sur des bases scientifiques, sur des bases, je dirais, cohérentes, avec une approche participative. C'est ça le, le, la pertinence de, de ce projet. Puis, je dirais, à l'échelle beaucoup plus euh, grand, l'OASIL permet de mettre en place des outils de travail et de prise de décision d'une grande importance si j'ai cité que euh, celui de, de l'audit et de la comptabilité de l'eau, c'est un concept qui est développé par la FAO, qui est un outil de prise de décision très important pour la gestion de la ressource de l'eau, surtout quand cette ressource devient de plus en plus rare. Et donc, euh, l'utilisation ou le développement de cet outil permettrait de faire des choix plus rationnels et des choix plus, euh, je dirais, plus appropriés aussi bien pour la durabilité que pour euh, la, euh, je dirais, l'accès à, à, à ces ressources. Cette, ces études ou ces, ces choix-là n'ont pas été juste restés théoriques. Il y a déjà des, 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 des c'est-à-dire des décisions sont déjà prises pour la réalisation, par exemple, de certains nombres d'ouvrages sur sur le terrain. On n'était pas resté au niveau national et donc on voudrait aller à l'échelle internationale. Et là, je voulais faire une petite annonce, entre parenthèses, si vous voulez. Nous allons annoncer à la COP28 l'alliance internationale des oasis. C'est une alliance qui vise à concrétiser la... Euh, euh, l'initiative Oasis Durable qui a été lancée par le Maloc à la COP22 et la FAO, à travers l'ensemble de ses organes, nous appuie dans cette initiative. Merci à vous. Oh, Mohamed, we have the last question from the gentleman there. Yeah. Uh, myself working as a scientist in Indian Council of Agriculture Research, and we are working on the slow-release fertilizers, particularly customized fertilizers in collaboration with the microbial interventions. So how do you think, uh, particularly the Brazilian government, how do you think that uh, it can be the future or one of the mitigation strategy in the future for, to get the uh, climate resilient options? Mm -hmm. So Sylvia, the question, they are working on slow-release fertilizers. And the question is, what's your take on, on the new methodologies of fertilizer, including slow release as a climate action? Uh, and maybe, uh, uh, Sor if you want to also take this question a little bit, otherwise you can, we can expand. We don't have much time. Maria Elena has to take the next panel. Yes, Sylvia, but very quickly, please. You have we have uh, been developed some by inputs products uh, to substitute uh, chemical fertilizers. For example, uh, ours is, a, uh, is developed uh, from the bacteria of uh, Mandacaru, is a product of the, uh, <clears throat> of, uh, of the north, northeast of Brazil. You have others by uh, Bioma Foz and the others to develop, but uh, Embrapa has uh, created a mission with uh, a group of uh, technicals to uh, train uh, uh, agronomists and the uh, technicals to uh, use the buy inputs more in in our uh, Embrapa has been trained uh, trained about 80,000 uh, uh, technicals around the Brazil to listen, uh, to promote by input products. Thank you very much, Sylvia. Very quickly, Sorlatis, just in one minute, if you can, how could we help you scale up the project, the successful project that you presented to us? In one minute, please as we need to move. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, this is a great success project because uh, we can 
transfer of the data that we produce to, to, to the farmer directly and the farmer, they can use this method for improve their uh, cultivation and this is, uh, like I say, is a great and it's uh, not only for farmer and also for the governments, we also need to collaborate between governments also because in Laos, you see many government have their own data and it's separately, but we can put them all together and we use them for the farmer and for any other that's uh, like a decision maker or policy maker to use all the data. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to the panel. Over to you, Maria Elena. Thank you and good morning to all. Again, let me introduce myself. I am Marilena Samedu, Deputy Director General of FAO, and I have been working very close with my colleague Ismahan, as she mentioned, in the development of these two strategies, and more than that, the implementation of the strategy in order to make results and to transform agri-food systems in the field as we are aiming to. Now we are having with us the three very eminent panelists, and they will talk to us to see how innovation can foster climate action through science and technology, a why illustrating synergies with FAO climate and innovation strategy and its action plan. To optimize time, let me go straight to our first speaker, Dominique Parisi. Dominico is a professor in sociology Senior Advisor for European and data, data Science Development at the Mississippi State University, with whom FAO has a long-standing partnership. Welcome, Dominique. You have eight minutes. And my question to you is, within the framework of the MOU, as I refer, between FAO and Mississippi State University, and in a high-performing, on-demand computing environment, what would be the key opportunity for FAO and Mississippi State University joint work and how they can complement each other to reach sustainable agriculture? Thank you and over to you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. It is wonderful to be here with, you all, with all of you. And I'm also profoundly honored to stand before you and represent my STEM university, Mississippi State University. I bring warm regards from our university leadership, our president, Dr. Kino, our provost, Dr. Shaw, and the entire family from Mississippi State University. We have had a long-standing partnership with uh, the agricultural and, and organization, uh, agriculture and food organizations of the United Nations for the last 10 years, if not more. And over these, uh, uh, time we have established and nourished, and nourished a very deep mutual respect for what we bring together to the commitment to fight hunger and poverty. So we hold in high esteem our fruitful partnership with FL, which is very well highlighted into this new high performance computing collaborations with the geospatial uh, water and land resource divisions of FL. A significant milestone was achieved last year by signing a new MOU, where this MOU underscore the collective focus on implementing data, more specifically big data and digital technology as essential tools to fight poverty and hunger. For decades, we have basically collected enormous amount of data to capture the essence of climate change. However, we have not been able to actually tap the full potential of these data for uh, obvious reasons that are inherent to the uh, complexity of data, but also because we have limited access to high performance computing in terms of processing large amount of data and in terms of actually running integrate, integrate models. However, we believe the hope is not lost, and our collaboration with FAO in implementing the agroecological zones modeling framework 
to understand the future of crop productions marks a significant step toward providing needed access to supercomputer capability to assess climate change and to provide support for farming actions. So what is this model? This is probably one of the most innovative models that FAO has developed and implemented over the last four decades. This model basically is based on seven analytical modules, module that basically include climate evaluations, optimal crop cycle, climate constraints, soil constraints, terrain constraints, and crop profitability. This methodology allows to develop an earth map that basically classified units of lands, zones, that, uh, that determines their capacity to produce food in diverse climate conditions for, for uh, individual crop types and farm methodology in terms of management approach and many other factors, including to the productions of agriculture. Over the last four decades, this model has improved so dramatically that it has changed the way we actually use data and the scale by which we're able to produce accurate results for this assessment. So we are not only able to produce assessment at global scales, we are now able to produce assessment at, at the regional, national, and now even local, if not a farm scale level. This is the complexity of this model. Over the year, the model has been relying on larger and more complex database. This has two implications. The first implications, it improved efficiency of the model in terms of providing assessment of the earth and its ability to produce food and sustain population growth. On the other hand, provides a major limitations because more data, more computer capacity. And so this requires what we call high performance computing. In, 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 so um, this kind of uh, limitation basically puts FAO in a position set advantage, even though it has developed this incredible methodology to understand demand and supply, but doesn't have the engine to run the, 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 the model. So thanks to the leadership of a very innovative individual here at FL, Matthew Henry and his staff, and his ability to put together a group that uh, synergizes resource and expertise from uh, partners such as the International Institute for Applied System Analysis and the Asian Institute of Technology have has helped us to accelerate the integration of high performance computing in this model to assess earth capacity in producing uh, food, uh, food agricultural productions. So Mississippi State has provided this needed um, resource, high performance computing. And because of that, because of long-term partnership with FL, we've been able to, for the first time at the global scale, run very successfully in matters of minutes, not hours, no dates, minutes, a global evaluations for climate conditions. Our next steps will be to actually complete the other six modules and then finally develop a global map with those zones that basically define the capacity of productions at this level, at the global scale. We also plan to expand the numbers of stakeholders that can have access to this model. In the past and currently it's only limited to the use of expertise within FAO, we want to expand basically this to many other stakeholders. And so give it the possibility for others to really help us to expand and use this model. We also would like to have this model be actually country specific. And so allowed country to use this model based on their own data and therefore uh, having more precise estimations and assessment for their population with their own boundaries. So the success of this first partnership, high performance community partnership has led us to another partnership. And now we are currently working with Nicholas Sitko, the, the team leader of the socioeconomic research and, al and analysis at the inclusive rural transformations and gender quality divisions of FL. So in this collaborations, we are now integrating high performance computing into what we call Atlas AI. It's one of the most elaborated, sophisticated database created by Stanford to understand at the local level, the socioeconomic conditions and the impact of social element in agricultural productions. It is undoubtedly clear that FAO recognizes 
and champions big data and digital technology as an essential tools to fight, uh, essential to the fight against hunger and poverty and to support all the other sustainable goals. Unfortunately, high-performance computing is not a resource available to everybody. It's not something that can be established uh, like going and buy a computer from a store. It requires a tremendous amount of resources, tremendous amount of expertise. And here's where Mississippi State comes in, in terms of our commitment, common commitment, to help FAO and many other stakeholders at the global level, at the lower level, to create opportunity to establish a resource that would allow the globe and the rest of the world to use high-performance computing as an essential tool to, um, to, 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 to do these kind of estimations. In conclusion, I like to highlight that our ongoing journey, guided by this new MOU, envisions a future in which high-performance computing uncovers new frontiers in climate action and sustainable agriculture. There's no question that the fight against world hunger is arduous, but with our, com our combined efforts, victory is not just possible, I believe it's imminent. <laughs> On behalf of our president, Dr. Keenum, our provost, Dr. Shaw, and the entire Mississippi State University family, I express our heartfelt gratitude for this alliance. We believe that together, we write a story of triumph over hunger and poverty, echoing the melody, hope, and prosperity for generation to come. Thank you. Th thank you, Dominica, for sharing with us this interesting partnership with FAO and Mississippi University. We join hands to bring methodology, to bring data in order to have fight against climate change and sustainable agriculture. Thank you, thank you and uh, we are here to strengthen and go, uh, going even forward, as you mentioned, in this partnership. Maintenant, j'ai le plaisir d'accueillir uh, Kadim Tin. C'est un farmer de Ulster au niveau du Sénégal. Il travaille sur la transformation de l'osteoculture et la value chain au Sénégal. Soyez la bienvenue. Et Kadim, ma question pour toi est la transformation de l'osteoculture pour conserver les mangroves au Sénégal est une belle réussite. Dis-nous quels sont les types d'innovations qui ont été utilisées pour faire si un beau exemple en faveur de l'action climatique. Merci. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Merci beaucoup. Et je tenais à remercier la, la FAO pour cette invitation. Comme vous l'avez dit, je m'appelle Harim Tine. Je suis manager du parc ostréicole La Cabane Penchée et président du réseau national de la chaîne de valeur huître, qui est constitué de tous les acteurs et actrices et aussi des membres étatiques et des chercheurs du Sénégal. Donc, euh, c'est ce euh, réseau que j'ai l'honneur de présider. Donc, euh, là, je suis très honoré d'être là et de partager avec vous sur le forum des sciences et de, de l'innovation face au changement climatique. Donc là, vous avez quelques slides, c'est-à-dire la mangrove. La mangrove, la mangrove est un écosystème unique à son genre et joue un rôle crucial dans la lutte contre l'érosion côtière et le changement climatique. Sa conservation pour préserver la biodiversité et garantir la sécurité alimentaire et l'économie des populations locales. Il est donc nécessaire d'adopter une approche globale, intégrée et participative pour assurer la gestion durable de la mangrove au Sénégal. Donc, nous avons différentes fonctions que remplit la mangrove, c'est-à-dire la contribution sur le maintien de la biodiversité, refuse et jeune de frayeur pour les plusieurs espèces. Aussi, la mangrove aussi constitue à la protection des côtes contre les vents, les vagues et l'érosion côtière. Nous avons aussi la fourniture des perches pour les cages les clôtures et autres constructions pour euh, les habitants locaux. Donc la fourniture de, du bois de chauffe pour les repas, fourniture des produits alimentaires aussi qui peuvent générer des revenus pour les poissons, huîtres et coquillages. Donc séquestration aussi de carbone ou stéquage de CO2 atmosphérique dans leurs tissus végétaux et dans les sédiments. Donc là, nous avons aussi deux, deux types d'aquaculture. De, 
Donc, nous avons l'ostréiculture artisanale et l'ostréiculture artisanale semi-améliorée. Donc, c'est ce qui existait déjà. Donc, euh, c'est pour cela qu'on dit que la mangrove doit être aidée et respectée afin de pouvoir jouer pleinement ses rôles multiples. Les communautés qui vivent au sein reconnaissent de plus en plus son importance, limitent l'impact de leur activité et participent active, activement aux opérations de reboisement. Mais elles doivent aussi promouvoir, pouvoir se développer l'ostréiculture ou élevage des huîtres et une activité qui permet à combiner la protection de la mangrove avec le développement socio-économique. Donc l'ostréiculture évite, je peux dire, évite aux femmes de devoir aller récolter les huîtres dans les mangroves et potentiellement endommager les racines et les rendre. Elle rend le travail plus simple et moins dangereux. Donc, c'est-à-dire de longs séjours dans les mangroves, soumis aux aléas des marées intempériques, et permet aussi de contrôler la production des huîtres et adapter aux besoins des différents marchés. Donc là, nous, là, je vais vous, je vous montrer. Nous avons à peu près les trois sites, les trois grands sites euh, des mangroves. Donc, euh, en quelques slides, je vous je vous montre euh, les sites qui, qui est dans le nord. Vous avez le delta du Sénégal et dans le delta aussi du Sin Salum et l'esprit de la Casamance. Donc, ce sont ces sites qui ont été euh, repérés pour faire l'ostréiculture au Sénégal. Donc, euh, delta du Salum. Donc, la mangrove est un véritable moteur naturel de lutte contre le changement climatique avec un énorme potentiel au Sénégal. Ce moteur ne tourne pas plein régime, malheureusement, perte de fonction, dégradation des mangroves. Donc, les causes, je peux dire, c'est la sécheresse des années 60, 1970, les changements climatiques. Donc, il y a aussi, je peux dire, les actions de l'homme sur le milieu, la surexploitation et coupe anarchique, construction de barrages, création des routes qui deviennent des barrages. Donc là, je, je vous donne quelques données qui ont été recueillies euh, au Sénégal. Comme vous l'avez dit, donc, euh, nous sommes le réseau. Le Sénégal compte plus de 13 000 acteurs et actrices, donc, euh, et qui est constitué par 98 on peut dire, des femmes. La plupart des pratiquantes, c'est des femmes. Et aussi, l'élevage moderne n'occupe que 2 ce qui est minime. Euh, nous produisons 16 000 tonnes à l'année et 97% viennent de la cueillette. Donc, c'est dans, ce, dans ce cadre le projet Fish for SCP, financé par l'Union européenne et la coopération allemande et mise en œuvre par la FAO en collaboration avec l'Organisation des États des Caraïbes, des États d'Afrique, des Caraïbes et du Pacifique, a identifié une série de contraintes qui doivent être levées afin de favoriser son développement développer la connaissance sur les, me sur les meilleures zones d'exploitation des huîtres et sur les car car caractéristiques de l'espèce en collaboration avec la recherche scientifique. Assurer la qualité sanitaire des eaux et des produits, besoin d'un système de suivi de zones et de production, soutenir la transition vers des pratiques d'ostréiculture moderne, cela nécessite l'adoption d'innovations technologiques par la filière et la cabane penchée peut servir de pilote pour le reste de la filière et développer les produits à haute valeur ajoutée, maîtriser la vente. Maîtriser la vente d'huîtres fraîches, par exemple, ce qui n'est traditionnellement pas fait au Sénégal, mais qui rapporte beaucoup plus. Je vends comme l'entreprise que je suis en train de diriger actuellement, qui s'appelle la cabane penchée, à, à maintenant, euh, je peux dire, à maintenant... Euh, la confiance des hôtels, restaurants et aussi des magasins de grande surface au Sénégal comme Auchan. Donc, euh, ce qui veut dire que hein, l'ostréiculture moderne peut être une alternative. Donc, euh, là, en quelque style, donc euh, là, c'est l'entreprise dont je dirige qui se trouve à la Somone et qui fait dans l'ostréiculture moderne, qui est fait de systèmes de captage moderne d'huîtres, ce qui peut préserver les mangroves, parce que je peux dire que là, je travaille avec des associations de femmes, beaucoup au Sénégal, que ce soit du nord au sud, et pour faire ce système de captage, avoir des huîtres 
qui peuvent être des huîtres de qualité qui peuvent rentrer dans tous les hôtels et restaurants de grande renommée. Donc, je suis, j'ai créé l'entreprise en 2018 au niveau de la lagune de Somon. Ma production annuelle est de 6 tonnes avec un système de pochon flottante, des huîtres de triploïdes gigas que j'achète au niveau des écologeries et des diploïdes gazar. Le gazar, c'est l'huître naturelle sénégalaise que je capte moi-même. Donc, euh, comme je l'ai dit tout à l'heure, actuellement, je travaille avec les hôtels, les restaurants et les magasins de grande surface. Donc, je suis persuadé que le succès du développement durable de la filière des huîtres au Sénégal passe par la collaboration, collaboration entre les différents acteurs de la filière, des pouvoirs publics, à penser par le secteur privé et la recherche scientifique. Ce partenariat public-privé a été, a été formalisé par le projet FISFO ACP et dont je suis le président. Cette plateforme va permettre au secteur d'opérer sa transition vers l'ostréiculture moderne de manière structurée et s'assurer que la filière devienne un moteur de développement socio-économique, mais aussi environnemental au Sénégal, en permettant de la, à la mangrove de jouer un nouveau pleinement, à nouveau pleinement ses multiples rôles, notamment dans la lutte contre le changement climatique. En vous remerciant de votre attention. Merci beaucoup. Vraiment, vraiment, c'est vraiment un, un très beau ex exemple de comment, comment, à travers les mangroves, on peut améliorer ou protéger nos écosystèmes, l'utilisation de la science, de l'innovation, faire la production des produits à haute valeur ajoutée, parce que les autres sont vraiment pour un niche de marché, et aussi en même temps développer un partenariat public-privé. On a tous les éléments de réussite, aussi la participation des femmes et la jeunesse qui a eu pris euh, ce risque, parce que ce n'était pas gagné à l'avance. Merci pour cela et merci pour partager ce beau exemple avec nous. Now is my pleasure to introduce Frank Omara, Director Agriculture and Food Development Authority, Ireland, and President of the Animal Task Force. Frank, my question to you. We know that Ireland aims to reduce greenhouse gas emission by 25% by 2030, while improving the efficient and income of livestock producers. What are the pathways and innovation in feed genetics, animal health, you have adopted to achieve this ambitious objective. What are the achievements and challenges? Please share with us. Thank, you very, you. thank you very much, uh, Deputy Director General and Chief Scientist and Excellencies and ladies and gentlemen. I'm really happy to be here this morning. I think this is a very good session to bring together science and innovation and climate change because I think science and innovation has a really important role to play in tackling climate change. So Ireland, um, we've adopted what we call a sustainable food systems approach to create a better food system for all. And, and that's very much in keeping with the four betters of the FAO. And as you said, we have a very tough target in relation to climate change, which is set in legislation, which is to reduce our, our agricultural greenhouse gas emissions by 25% by 2030. And we want to do this without reducing farmers' incomes and without reducing our contribution to global food and nutrition security. And bear in mind, agriculture in Ireland, for those of you that haven't visited, is predominantly based on livestock. 90% of our agricultural land is in the form of managed grassland. So we very much are in the business of producing milk and meat from grassland. So to achieve this target of a 25% reduction in emissions, Farmers need support at three levels. So policy is, is very important. Market incentives have a big part to play, and that's where industry can play its role. And finally, there's a very important role for advice, for research, and for education. And that's where my organization, Chagas, contributes, and that's what I'm going to talk about this morning. So two years ago, we launched the Signpost program to help farmers to take action to address climate change. And we use the word signpost because we want to point farmers in the direction of a more sustainable future. Chagas leads this programme 
but there are 62 other partner organisations from right across the agri-food sector. And that's very much in keeping with the multi-actor approach, which we know is very important for effective knowledge transfer. So in the signpost programme, essentially what we want to do is to help farmers prepare a plan to reduce emissions on their own farm by selecting technologies or system improvements. And then we will give them advisory support over the following three years to help implement that plan. And we'll monitor their progress along the way. A key part of the programme has been the establishment of a network of 120 demonstration farms across all our enterprises and across all the country. And the, the farmers that run these, these 120 farms or that own, own these 120 farms, they're all good farmers and they're all well respected in their communities. These farms, they're using the technologies that we know will reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So we use these farmers for events and we tell their stories on social media, on print media, digital media and the broadcast media. And we take advantage of peer-to-peer -peer learning because we know that farmers learn better from other farmers than they do from experts like me. So in summary, the signpost program consists of these 120 demonstration farms. And then with all our other farmers, we plan to work with 50,000 of them over the, next, uh, over the rest of this decade to develop a plan for their farm and to help them implement that plan. So what are the technologies and system improvements that we're asking farmers to adopt? Well, in the first phase, there's a lot of technologies fo focusing around nitrogen fertilizer, which produces the greenhouse gas nitrous oxide. And what we're talking about here is reducing the overall amount of nitrogen fertilizers that farmers use in their grassland systems by replacing fertilizer with clover, by making better use of animal manures, and by improving soil fertility. And we're also encouraging farmers to switch to a low emissions type of fertilizer for the remaining or residual fertilizer that they will have to use on their farm. In relation to reducing emissions of methane, there are two main approaches that we're taking at the moment. The first is breeding more efficient animals and in the long term, breeding animals that are low emitters of methane. Although there's a lot of research still needed on that to bring that to reality. The second approach that we're taking is to reduce the lifetime emissions of our beef animals by getting them to their target slaughter weights at a younger age. And our farmers do this through better genetics, better nutrition and better animal health. An interesting approach that we're currently evaluating is the role of feed additives to reduce methane. And we've tested a number of these in research trials and we're currently planning a large on-farm trial that will use one of these feed additives, a product called Beauvais, on 12 of our signpost dairy demonstration farms in the, current, in, 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 the, in the coming months. So that's the plan. And I suppose you might ask, how are we doing so far with that plan? Well, in relation to nitrogen fertilizer use, over the last two years, we have seen approximately a 30% reduction in the amount of nitrogen used across all our grassland farms in Ireland. And that's actually about where we wanted to get to by 2030. So we've made tremendous progress on that uh, in the last two years. Driven to a large extent by the increase in the price of fertilizer over the last two years. But not just that, because we also see that farmers are adopting the technologies that allow them to reduce nitrogen fertilizer and still grow enough grass for their livestock. And that is using clover to fix nitrogen, making better use of their animal manures and improving soil fertility. In relation to switching the residual nitrogen fertilizer to a low emissions type, we are now at a level of 10% of our nitrogen fertilizer being in the form of protected urea. So still a long way to go to get that to 100% or close to it by 2030, but we're on the journey. In relation to reducing the age at slaughter of our beef animals, we have reduced that, or when I say we, that's a royal we, that's our farmers supported by, by Chagask, have reduced that by 45 days in the case of dairy beef animals and by 60 days in the case of animals born to beef cows over the last decade. 
and we hope to continue that rate of progress and accelerate it over the remainder of this decade. We're also making very good progress in Ireland in terms of breeding more efficient animals. So what's next for us? Well, the priority now is to continue to enrol farms into our signpost programme and to continue the research to develop and improve technologies that will reduce emissions on our farms. And we will do that in partnership with farmers and all the other actors across the supply chain. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank, for sharing with us the results of this important project and the role of feed innovation. I think it's a project where you refer to the farmers. I hope one day we'll be able to bring the farmers here to FAO to share uh, their experience, but how we are, we are able to reduce the need of nitrogen, uh, to reduce the need of fertilizer, the importance of breeding, bet, uh, bringing better genetics, the animal health, improving animal health, and also to increase the livelihoods of those farmers. Now, with this time, you have some time for questions and answers. Please, if you have any question, address the panel, raise your hand. We have also our friends connected virtually that will be may asking questions. Now the floor is over to the audience. Let's see if you have any questions. Okay, please go ahead. Merci, je vais parler en français si je peux. Et une oui, question si vous plaît, allez-y. Adressée à, à Khadim, Khadim Tin, so, merci, merci d'être là. J'aimerais, euh, si vous pouviez, en tant que patron d'une PME africaine, si vous pouviez euh, détailler un petit peu pour vous quelles sont les clés qui vous ont permis d'accéder aux innovations euh, dont vous avez besoin euh, pour le développement de votre entreprise. Merci. Khadim Merci beaucoup, merci beaucoup. Et je vais dire que, comme je l'ai dit tout à l'heure, euh, on a toujours connu l'ostréculture artisanale, c'est-à-dire la cueillette des huîtres au niveau des mangroves. C'est ce que j'ai connu avant qu'on s'est mis vers une ostréculture moderne, ce que je suis en train de faire. Donc les innovations dont on a besoin, c'est un système de captage moderne, quelque chose que j'ai installé. Euh, là, j'en ai même amené. Cette année, donc, ce sont des capteurs, des capteurs de naissance d'huîtres que j'ai mis au Sénégal, j'ai installé au Sénégal avec des associations de femmes dans le site Saloum. Donc, ces capteurs, auparavant, c'était les mangroves qui captaient les huîtres et les femmes coupaient les capteurs. Donc, maintenant, c'est avec ces capteurs qu'on capte les huîtres. Donc, du coup, les mangroves sont préservées. Donc, on a besoin de ces capteurs pour pouvoir faire une ostréculture moderne et relever le défi de l'innovation aussi. Et pour la, 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 euh, le grossissement des huîtres aussi, nous avons besoin de, de pochons. Donc, chose aussi que j'ai importé de France. Donc, euh, on n'en a pas au Sénégal pour l'instant, malheureusement. Donc, euh, j'ai commencé avec mes propres moyens. Donc, avec ça, nous, je commence à produire 6 tonnes à l'année, chose qui ne s'était jamais fait au Sénégal. Donc, euh, merci beaucoup. Bravo No more questions? Oh, please, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Richard from Zambia. Uh, my question is directed to uh, the last speaker. Is it Frank? Uh, yes, you made mention that you want to reduce uh, carbon emission by 25% by 2030. And you uh, highlighted that uh, you're encouraging farmers to switch to low emission fertilizers. I was just curious, uh, how available are these uh, fertilizers? Uh, how accessible are they? Um, I think as well as uh, uh, affordable and, 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 and so forth. I wanted to just find out who exactly is uh, providing these uh, low emission fertilizers in that project with your farmers. Thank you. Thank you for the, the question. So the low emission fertilizers are obtained by the fertilizer manufacturers. They, they add a compound that slows down the release of um, ammonia from the fertilizer. 
So any of the fertilizer manufacturers can, can make that type of fertilizer. So for us, the, the first job was to, to do research to demonstrate that they were as effective as the conventional fertilizers that we want farmers to replace. And once we had that research done, then we, we started the process of disseminating that information to our farmers and uh, supporting them to, to change that type of fertilizer. So our 120 demonstration farmers, they all use that type of fertilizer now. They find it as effective as the conventional fertilizer. It's actually a little bit cheaper than some of the conventional fertilizers. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's not that difficult to persuade farmers to adopt it. And uh, we are now across the whole country, uh, we have got to 10% of our nitrogen fertilizer being in the form of that, um, what we call protected, uh, protected fertilizer. So we, we, are, we are on a journey, we still have a long way to go, but we think we have a good start made. Thank you. Now I have a last question to Domineco, and is the Mississippi State University. How does your university seize its future collaboration with FAO? Uh, I think the future kind of writes itself given the need of high performance computing. As I said, high performance computing is not something that you can um, develop by simply buying machines it requires a sort of expertise in computational analysis, programming, data acquisition, data storage, data processing, utilizations, data governance, data security, <laughs> AI, applications of AI. So it's a very complex uh, thing. So high performance computing seems kind of a simple in the way it sounds, but at the end of the day, to make it work, it requires partnerships at the global level, at the regional, state and also farm level. Um, I also think that this is essential since one of the uh, goals they're also be trying to uh, do with FAO uh, as part of the MOU is to facilitate digitally enable extension. For this to work, you have to rely on data. For us to be able to anticipate uh, emerging issue with AI, you have to have basically access to very powerful machines. So we see as an essential partner and achieving the four batters of FL. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, dear participants, we are reaching to the end of our interesting and engaged se session. Before I say some words to closing, let's give a round of applause to our panelists. Thank you all for coming and sharing with us so enlightening examples how we can connect science, technology, and climate change. And I think that this session shows clearly the multiple links between climate action, science and innovation, and how they can reinforce each other. Climate change leads ground action on science and also to innovate. And we have a lot to innovate to feel what we have engaged in Paris. As illustrated by the example shown today, climate action in agri-food system often requires transformative approaches combining multiple types of innovation, technical, social, and institutional. I also draw from today, today's example some critical points. The importance of involving all actors, the role of partnership, the factor that solutions are context specific, no one size fits all. But there are also a big potential of exchange of experience, knowledge across sector and scale, and also the need to enabling factors, the governance, technology, transfer and investments. The two strategies and their action plans recognize the importance of these three elements. And we are moving forward to integrating what came from today's discussion. The two strategies were developed around the same time in close collaboration with our FAO members. I think has been the two more involved, inclusive strategies that we have ever had in FAO. And there is a logical between the link, uh, these two strategies. Addressing climate change in agri-food system is a top global priority, where effective climate action must be grounded on science and innovation. 
The strategy on climate change is based on three key pathways. Strengthen global and regional and climate policy and governance, developing countries' capacities for climate action, and scaling up climate action on the ground. The science and innovation strategy also focuses on three key pathways, and they are strengthening the science and evidence-based decision-making in agri-food system, supporting innovation and technology on the ground, and making sure that FAO serves its members better by reinforcing its own capacity in the dynamic world of science and innovation. To support FAO members in implementing climate action, the strategy on climate action and its action plan must count on science and innovation. I think I don't need to bring more reasons why those science and innovation and climate change are connected. Now we are moving towards the action plan is where we really need to work on the ground with the farmers, with the governments, with all partners. And there, as I said, we can really transform our agri-food system to be sustainable, to be resilient and to also bring livelihoods to people. I wish to thank you all again for being here. Let me thank my colleague Ismahan, with whom I have been working very close during these three years. She's leaving us, as Digi said, but our collaboration don't stop here. I'm sure from the CIR, we'll be, you will be contributing to implementing these two strategies beyond all the collaboration with FAO. All the best in your these new endeavors. Thank you all again for being here. Wish you a good day and a good weekend.